One of the risks for long-term investors is not taking enough risk. In other words, people are holding money back from the equity market because they're worried about a market crash. Now, personally, I found a very effective way to overcome that fear is to create a market crash shopping list. This is a list of funds which I like, but which are currently too expensive. And that way I reframe my view of a crash as a buying opportunity. So now let's look at my market crash shopping list in a bit more detail. So why bother with a market crash shopping list at all? Why not simply buy the funds you like right now? It's been so long since we've had a big equity market crash that it's easy to forget the mindset when it's actually happening. If you read the media during a market crash, then you may well think that it's the apocalypse, that the financial world is ending and that stocks will never recover. And that can lead to a terrible outcome because the real apocalypse would be if you sell your equity. That would crystallise a loss and you may be locked out of markets as equity markets recover. So this market crash shopping list is my way of reframing the narrative to make me behave properly when markets crash. And that's to go out and see things as a bargain. I should stress that this choice is very personal and I'm sure you'll have funds which you like which are completely different from mine. But if you are constructing your own market crash shopping list, there are two very simple criteria. Firstly, you have to like the fund. You have to like the things which are in the fund, but you also have to think it's got good long-term return prospects. But at the same time, it's a fund which you think is currently overpriced. Maybe you missed the boat, you didn't buy it when it was at a lower price, and you want a second bite of the cherry. So by waiting for equity markets to panic, you can make use of that panic by buying in at a better entry point. The first of my five choices is a quality equity fund. Now quality is a type of factor investing and I love this definition of quality in a paper by Asnes, Frazzini and Pedersen called Quality Minus Junk and they describe it as stocks which are safe, profitable, growing and well managed and they publish a spreadsheet which shows the outperformance of quality versus junk over a long period of time and this is what it looks like. And what you can see is that over this 60 year period, quality has outperformed junk. Although there have been short periods, usually during periods of market exuberance, when junk actually rallied more than quality. Now some people call that a flight to shite. The index company MSCI publishes an index for quality for the US and for other regions. And here you can see how much it's fallen versus its all time peak. These are drawdown periods when people get scared. So for example, when the dot-com bubble burst, you can see that quality fell by 40% relative to its previous all-time high. But then in the lower panel, we can see another factor investing approach, which is to buy cheap stocks. That's called value investing. And there the drawdowns have lasted longer and they've also been deeper. One way of quantifying the depth and the duration of those drawdowns, which cause ulcers, is using this thing called the ulcer index. And the ulcer index for quality is less than it is for value. But shorter and more shallow drawdowns are one of the reasons why I like quality as a factor. Just ETF, which is a great resource for finding European exchange traded funds, shows six quality funds which European investors can buy. And I've actually sorted these from low expense ratio to high expense ratio at the bottom. So my choice of quality fund would probably be one of these two at the top. You can see both of them track this MSCI World Quality Factor Index. If I show the returns of those six funds, and one caveat here is that the ones at the top, XDEC and IWFQ, are both accumulation funds, whereas the others are income funds, so the actual return you'd get for those would be higher because of the income they pay. But what I'm after here is not a dividend fund. I don't want necessarily a high income, but what I do want is a combination of good capital gains and maybe high income as well. So my preference would be for these two funds at the top. This MSCI World Quality Index is the index which those two funds track. And you can see that it's outperformed MSCI World, which is remember just developed markets, over this fairly long period since 2006. And that that outperformance has been fairly steady. Now two index providers will have different definitions of quality. So the three criteria used by MSCI are high return on equity. And that looks at how many dollars of net profit are generated for every dollar of equity in the company. 
and ideally you'd like that return on equity to be as high as possible. The second criterion is based on profit growth. Ideally you'd have something where profits are growing steadily rather than being very volatile year to year. And MSCI's third criterion is based on not taking too much leverage. If a company's borrowed too much, then it may not be able to repay those obligations in future, and that creates a business risk and greater risk of default. Now this index is currently priced at very high levels, and to see why, we can look at the top 10 holdings of the fund. What this table does is it compares the holdings of the fund with its parent index, which you can see beneath me here, and that's MSCI World. So for example, Microsoft has a holding of 3.5% in MSCI World, but the MSCI holding in this index is higher. It's 5.5%. In fact, for many of these FANG stocks, which have dominated US outperformance, this index is overweight. And the reason for that is that these companies are high quality companies. So I think if there was an equity market crash, I think that would provide a great entry point for a long-term holding in this fund. The second item on my market crash shopping list is a real estate investment trust called Tritax Big Box. A company can become a REIT and that way they don't have to pay corporation tax. So for you, it's a very tax efficient way to milk that commercial real estate income. Now, if I plot the return of Tritax Big Box versus the UK FTSE 250, so Big Box is here in red and the FTSE 250 tracker from Vanguard, VMID, is in blue, you can see that after the pandemic, Big Box has been very popular. Its share price has certainly rocketed. And that's why I think a market crash would provide a better entry point for this REIT. If you look at a list of Big Box's clients, you can see that Amazon is its biggest. So if Amazon needs one of these warehouses, it simply leases that space from Big Box. But the other clients are also big UK retailers. And if you look at the duration of those leases that the companies have, they tend to be quite long. So that means that Big Box has a fairly reliable and steady source of income from fairly reliable counterparties. If we look at the rental income over time, that's been gradually increasing since 2016. And because the cost of sales isn't too high, the profit has also been growing fairly consistently over that period. And you can see the distribution of properties from big box are all clustered around population centers, but also near to transportation routes. So I think big box is very well placed to benefit from this trend of online shopping. And it does that indirectly by leasing space to these e-retailers. So I like the fundamentals of the company, but currently I think it's overpriced. So I think that means that Big Box definitely earns a place on my market crash shopping list. Scottish Mortgage is a fund which I've been watching for some time, and I did a review of it a few years back. In fact, Scottish Mortgage is the UK's equivalent of the ARK funds from Cathie Wood in the United States. It buys shares in companies which are disruptive and which stand to have very high growth in future. So if I plot the returns of Scottish Mortgage versus ARK Innovation, you can see the two track each other quite closely. Both, for example, had very large allocations to Tesla and benefited from that allocation. And in particular, after the pandemic crash and the pandemania rally that followed, both of them made incredible returns. And you can see that that crazy rally ended in February 2021. What you can also see is that the prices remain very elevated. And this is why I wouldn't buy it right now. Now, there are a couple of caveats. For example, James Anderson, who is managing the fund, is leaving, but his co-manager is staying in the job and someone else is going to join the team. And they also rely on a very large research team. So hopefully there will be continuity with their approach to investing. Now, many of the reasons for the success of the fund are also risks. For example, it has a very high active share. It deviates very much from any global benchmark. That's because it tends to take very concentrated bets in a fairly small number of stocks, some of which are unlisted. They're not traded on public exchanges yet. And it's made some big reallocations recently. For example, it sold 80% of its shares in Tesla, which made up a big proportion of the fund. And it's tilted towards China, which may not seem wise given what's been happening recently. But the justification for that is that Chinese companies can scale more effectively. And at the same time, it's been moving away from US mega cap tech stocks. For example, Facebook, Alphabet and Amazon. And that's because those companies probably can't scale at the same pace as Chinese tech companies. But if you want to learn more about what I think about Scottish Mortgage, including their brilliant governance structure, you can watch my review about it.
One of the big themes at the moment is the energy transformation theme, and one requirement for that transformation will be batteries. Now this item was actually inspired by an explainer I did for our Patreon supporters, and if you do want access to this library of content and the ability to ask me for new content, then you can always click on the link at the top of this page or in the description in order to learn more. The most commonly used battery technology at the moment relies on a certain type of chemistry, extrapolating the current growth of electric vehicles into the future, assuming that chemistry doesn't change for batteries, that would increase the demand for lithium, cobalt and nickel by between 17 times and up to 30 times for nickel. So one way to play this trend is by buying into those commodities or companies which produce those commodities. But I think one danger with that is that the technology for this is developing very rapidly. One alternative chemistry would substitute aluminium or aluminum, which is cheaper than manganese. Another alternative would be lithium iron phosphate. And a third pair of alternatives would be lithium sulfur and lithium air. So depending on which of those technologies really takes off, the difference in demand could be huge. Lithium, you can see, is common to all three technologies, but if these two alternative technologies take off, then the demand for cobalt and the demand for nickel would be much lower. So this rapid innovation is why I probably wouldn't play this trend directly via commodities. I'd rather pay a bit extra, so the fee for these two funds is around 0.4 or 0.49% and have some company do the research for me. So these two battery funds you can see here, one is from Wisdom Tree and the other one is from Legal and General. If we focus on the Wisdom Tree fund, the cheaper one, which is probably the one I'd buy, you can see that all of these are companies which either produce materials for batteries or the technology that goes behind batteries. So there is a big weighting in industrials and materials, but also in information technology. The country weightings also reflect the countries which are being most innovative in creating this new technology, and that's dominated by China, the US and Japan. And what's interesting about this fund is that it tracks an index which is created by Wisdom Tree itself. That may be one way to reduce costs because they don't have to pay a license fee to a third party such as MSCI. So I certainly believe in this trend and I'd like exposure to this theme, but ideally I'd like to pay less for it. So this would be on my shopping list. The last item on this list is high yield credit. Now for the purpose of illustration of how junk bonds work, I'm going to use this fund, which is from Janus Henderson, but because the management fee for this fund is so high, it would rule it out as one of my investments. But what's great about this fund is that it's been around for a long time. And this is why you buy one of these funds. It's a stream of monthly dividend payments. Now you can see that they do vary over time, but what you can see is that most of the time the monthly dividend is around 5 cents. So an annual dividend would be around 60 cents. So you don't buy this fund for capital gain, you buy it for this income stream. In this top panel you can see the price of that fund since 2000. As I say you don't buy it for capital gain and this is an income fund, so actually the price of the fund has gone down steadily over time. The middle pane shows you why you're buying the fund. That's because of the dividend which it pays, and here I've summed it over the previous 12 months. The reason being that I can calculate a dividend yield. Now that's defined as how much the funds paid you over the last 12 months, divided by the price you pay for that income stream today. So think of the price of the fund today as an entry fee to get on board with those income payments. And ideally, you'd like to pay as small an entry fee as possible. So in 2008, the entry fee went down a lot. But what's interesting is that the dividend didn't. And that meant that the dividend yield spiked. So when the dividend yield is above 7%, that represents a good buying opportunity for this fund, for example. Another good entry point, which was very brief, was in 2020, when equity markets crashed, and so did the price of this fund. And if you look at the yield on the fund, you can see that it went above 7% very briefly. So that would have represented a good entry point for the fund. So this is a way to gauge when to buy these high yield funds. Look for a period of time when the yield spikes to high levels. And 7% is a pretty good threshold. Now for European investors, there are lots of these funds to choose from. As usual, I've listed them sorted by expense ratio. And you can see the cheapest two here are 0.2% per year and 0.3%. So these are probably the candidates which I'd consider for my portfolio. 
So I hope that's inspired you to come up with your own market crash shopping list. Of course, your list won't be the same as mine, but the purpose will be the same, which is to reframe market crashes as buying opportunities. Now, if you do want to learn more about investing and you want to keep track of what's going on in markets and which macroeconomic factors are important to monitor, then we create a free weekly market roundup only one per week, so it won't flood your inbox. We try to keep it interesting and punchy. And if you want to learn more about that, you can just click on the link beside me and in the description below me. And as always, thank you for listening.